Hey, it's Jeremy from Jeremy.net. I am a comic book artist, writer, creator, self-publisher, and I share my creative process here with you online. If you'd like to support this channel, get additional bonus live streams twice a month, be able to read my comic books digitally for free online, and more, you can become a Patreon subscriber at patreon.com slash Jeremy. It's patreon.com slash G-E-R-I-M-I. If you'd like to get a free digital sketchbook, receive animated work in progress gifts delivered right to your inbox, along with uh, just little blog posts about, you know, what I'm working on, books that I'm reading, what's going on in my creative life beyond just here on YouTube, you can subscribe for my monthly newsletter at newsletter.jeremy.net. And if you'd like to purchase physical copies of my comic books, if you read digitally on uh, Comixology or Kindle, you can go to amazon.jeremy.net. They'll forward you to my Amazon author page. You can pick up books like my first graphic novel, Eye of the Gods. It is a psychological thriller about a man cursed with visions he cannot control. It's a self-contained graphic novel. You can also pick up my most recent series, Morningstar. It tells the story of Lucifer's fall from heaven as a Western. It is a eight-issue series. This volume contains issues one through four. The conclusion, Morning Star Volume 2, Abandon All Hope, contains issues five through eight, the conclusion of this series. Both of them have extensive bath matter showing character sketches, script excerpts, thumbnails, and more insight into my creative process. You can pick up all of those at my Amazon author page at amazon.jeremy.net. And on the previous week's live stream, um, Ed MN from our, our uh, community pointed out that the links in my descriptions were broken. And I have spent the last week going through hundreds of videos <laughs> updating those broken links. So all of the links in the video description should be working now. And for any of the previous videos, I'm still working backwards. I've still got a couple hundred that I have to, to go and update. But for now, all of the, the links in previous videos that link to my Patreon, to my newsletter, to, to the Amazon author page, and, and any other links in those, those should all be fixed. And if anybody watching comes across any broken links in any of my future videos or any of my past videos, leave a comment. Send me a message. Let me know. It helps me out. I don't feel like anyone's complaining. I want this channel to be as good as possible. That includes fixing any broken links. So... On that note, I see Byron's here. How you doing, Byron? Thanks for, for rolling in. So I am going to give you an update on where I am with the dragon painting that I've been working on. And then I'm gonna we're gonna go into working on something a little bit different. So let me get my camera in position. Let me get my little camera light turned on here. And let me check and see. All right, this could be a little bit lower. All right, this would probably be easier if I just take this board off of the table and show you what I got to show you. All right, so. Tick, tick, tick. Here we go. All right. So I've been working on this series of um, of acrylic painted thumbnails for this dragon painting that I'm working on, this large scale painting for my wife. And I've shown you where I started, which was working on a couple of little swatches, just trying to work out you know, my basic colors I was starting with, some burnt sienna, some white, some yellow oxide. I don't know why I don't have a little spot of burnt umber up there. I'd made lists and I was intending to have all of those and then just work out what they look like when I mixed different values, different ratios of white into it. The point was, was just trying to figure out what the colors were likely to appear as when I went through and did all these thumbnails. So I started with doing a set of thumbnails just uh this one is just the this one was me starting with using multiple colors and when i started with that i realized no wait i need to to work out what it looks like with all of my base colors first to see which one i want to start with with my base hey, i see thomas elliott's in the chat i see herman rolled in he said nice bro wow bro nice comps i appreciate that thank you um 
I learned a lot from doing these comps, and there's a bunch here. I'm going to kind of talk through where I ended up because where I ended up with these comps affects the other thing that I'm going to work on after this. And it kind of, I think it's going to inform a lot of my, my creative process going forward. So, you know, I worked through, and, and you guys have seen, people have been watching the recent videos have seen these. So I did a version of the painting in burnt, um, in a uh, burnt sienna, yellow ochre, and burnt umber. And the burnt umber actually feels closest to the tone that I was going for. It's got, you know, just, just because of the fact that it's warm being browns, but it's not as warm as the uh, the burnt sienna, which is, you know, much more reddish orange, a lot more of a brick red. So then I thought, all right, if this is what I'm using for my base, the, uh, the burnt umber, let me go in now and start trying to paint a couple. And I wanted to see, you know, part of doing the thumbnails, doing the comps, is working through what are some other variations. And I thought, well, if I want to warm this up even more and go really orangey, what happens if I, I combine uh, the burnt sienna and the, the yellow ochre? And that moves it from kind of a, a brick red to a very yellowy orange. <clears throat> and I just wanted to work through all the possible combinations. So, you know, I also tried the, the, um, the yellow ochre with the, the burnt sienna. And with that, as opposed to having a piece that just goes warmer altogether, it very much made the, the cooler nature of the burnt umber by being less saturated. It made that stand out so that it really felt like the, the burnt umber was the cool and the, uh, the yellow, it's not yellow ochre, it's yellow oxide, which is close to yellow ochre. Um, and the, the, I've mentioned this before, the reason why I'm using yellow oxide is just because the store the art store I went to didn't have any yellow ochre in your lot. So I'm like, eh, it's in the ballpark. Um, now, the, my favorite one I did was when I just did burnt umber and burnt sienna. And that actually feels like they really complement each other in terms of the, the burnt umber feeling like the, uh, the cool and the burnt sienna feeling like the warm. Like on my own, this would be the painting that I would have made. And then I made one more just trying a different uh like trying the burnt umber and really like holding back on it so i could fit so i could show more of it let more of the yellow oxide show through because on this one it's like i painted a whole burnt umber first and then just added some yellow oxide in this one i i intentionally left more more white space for the yellow oxide now when i got to these two and i knew that this one was the one i was happy with the next step, and this is probably about where we were left off last week, was I realized that the one comment, the feedback that I got from my wife when I was showing her the comps, I mean, in this case, she's the client for this painting, was that in the previous iteration that I had worked on, that it was just too dark. Because this is going to be a, a large decorative piece for our home, and she just did not want a large, dark canvas in the room. And even though this has a lot of white in it, you know, surrounding the dragon that the, just overall the, the tone is too dark so i said well let me come back and try to recreate this color this color palette but in a lighter just a, just raising the values so in this uh, just with everything except for the foreground um silhouetted figure i really pulled back and then maybe i still use some some of the dark around the upper parts you know to really get that sense of a of an underlit figure so, you know, it was still dark around the top of the wings, you know, the, the part of the chest turning away, you know, going like that. And also just to kind of play off it, I, I said, well, let me also try with the, the burnt umber and yellow oxide just to see. So I had these two and basically I got to this and I thought, all right, I'm pretty much done now. This is my comp. But hold on. Hold on, folks. There's the thing. I was using... The, and I, you know, I've been painting with acrylics with this, and I was using the acrylics, the acrylics the way I tend to do with my my own my regular personal work, which I tend to work on paper with acrylics, and I thin them with water. I use the acrylics basically like wash or or a watercolor, because the whole way I kind of landed on acrylics is just that I started doing personal works in watercolor, but I am impatient. The thing that people hate about acrylics is how quickly they dry. I love how quickly they dry. I like to work fast. I mean, you can see by the fact that I did, you know, a gang of 
thumbnails over this, I obviously like to do a lot of stuff quickly as opposed to very slowly and meticulously build up a single piece. So I was using these acrylics thin with water. And it occurred to me, well, when I go to work on the canvas, I can't do that because on the canvas, you know, if you thin it with water, it's not going to adhere to the, the canvas and the paint isn't going to adhere to itself as well. The acrylic, you know, water thins the acrylic so much that it won't, it doesn't bind together as a paint as well. So I thought, all right, I have to work opaquely, meaning I have to mix my color so that it is, you know, the full consistency of the paint all the way through. And I have to figure out how to get these colors while working opaquely, even if I'm going to be, you know, painting a lot of white. And so this thumbnail right here is my first attempt at trying to work opaquely. And as you can see, it's a little bit muddier. And this one, it's darker. It, it's muddier and it's darker than this one. And it also, you know, it's closer to the values of this one above it, which I was happy with, except for the fact that it was too dark. So I said, all right, well, how do I get this and have my colors not be muddy, but also raise the value? And that's when I remembered. I hadn't been using medium, acrylic medium. So what acrylic medium is, hmm, I thought I had the jar right here next to me. I must have moved it to a different area, different room, the room where I'm going to be doing the actual large painting. So acrylic medium is just, it's the liquid that holds the pigment. So if you were to take like an acrylic cyan or an acrylic, um, you know, cadmium red paint, if you were to remove all of the pigment, all the cadmium red, you just have this clear gel, that's what um, that's what medium is. It's just the clear gel that the paint goes in. Um, and I realized, wow, this whole time I was doing this, I was not working with the medium. I have medium, I know what it's for, and I wasn't using it. Why? Because I haven't been painting in years and I'm out of practice. And the most important thing about these thumbnails that I want to express is that the act of doing, you know, this sheet, and then this sheet, and then I had like one more that I did. The act of doing all of these was like reteaching myself how to paint. You know, like it's been so long since I've been doing it. This was <laughs> Byron's in the chat. <laughs> he says, I was just about to write, use a bit of medium. <laughs> Well, man, I mean, you can lead a horse to water. You can't tell him to drink. Um, I needed to remember it on my own. And it made all the difference when I switched to, to medium. Because to go back to the, um, the thumbnails that I was making here, all these different things where I was seeing how the color worked out, you know, I have a couple of little swatches right here. And I was thinking about trying a base. Instead of doing a burnt sienna or a burnt umber, I tried a base that was equal parts burnt sienna and burnt umber. And then I tried doing a base that was equal parts burnt sienna and burnt umber with like one, like, so be one part burnt sienna, one part burnt umber, and then one part white to light it up. And then I tried it with one part burnt sienna, one part burnt umber, two parts white, and then four parts white. And this was all to just sort of see like what happens as I slowly lighten it up. And to the, the point about using, um, about using medium, when you use medium, my, my problem was the paintings I was doing were too dark. When you use white, you raise the value, but you desaturate the color. However, on the, uh, the side here, I did another couple of thumbnails where, or not thumbnails, but I did a couple of swatches where I took that same combination, burnt sienna, burnt umber, burnt sienna, burnt umber, but instead of one part, instead of two parts or four parts white, I was doing two parts or four parts medium. And as you can see, this is more transparent now, but what it does is it raises the value, makes it lighter while retaining the saturation. So now it becomes a glaze that you're laying over it, but it is something that you can do where you can apply this and still keep the level of darkness. So the problem I had here is I got colors that were muddy and washed out. Whereas in this one, and this is the one that's the, the final 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 this is what i'm going to base the final piece on i was able to get places where i have very rich saturated burnt sienna and burnt umber in the shadow areas 
while still lightening up with white in some of the 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 lower areas as it's getting closer and closer to that ground plane and that white around there. So that was just like, wow, solved everything. Let's see here. Uh, Herman asks in the chat, he says, how often do you do these types of get togethers? It's been a minute since I've seen your work on the Western comic on YouTube. So I definitely want to pick up the Western comic you've created. First off, Herman, thank you so much. And, uh, and Byron mentions in the chat, it's a, uh, it's 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern every Sunday. And yeah, I do. So every Sunday, uh, I'm on the West Coast. So I usually say 11 a.m. Pacific, but yes, 2 p.m. Eastern. So yeah, check whatever your time zone is. And by the way, I try to post a link for the following live stream, like an hour or so, or not. Usually, right after I finish this live stream, I try to create the link for the next week's live stream. So when this live stream ends, you can go and refresh my actual YouTube page if you go to the channel. You, you'll see a, a, um, a link for next week's video that's scheduled. You just click um, um, set reminder on, the, uh, on that video and it'll alert you when the, the next live stream starts. So yeah, I do it every week. Um, I may take a week or two off during uh, Christmas and New Year's. But other than that, uh, it's, it's every Sunday. And uh, yeah, yeah. So definitely, you know, check it out. Oh, and I realized, speaking of live streams, for those of you who are Patreon subscribers, I want to give you a reminder that this week is another art book study group. That's uh, the big, the the um, the the Patreon exclusive live streams we do. And I've posted a sample of the art book study group free for the public. But what it is is we go through some of the finest art books out there and we sit down and do studies from them and we talk about art and process and what we're all struggling with and trying to learn. Basically, I'm sharing with you my process for trying to love love as an artist because I look at myself as somebody who I'm experienced, but I'm not a master. Um, I have some knowledge, but I haven't I haven't mastered draftsmanship. I haven't mastered color and composition. Um, I haven't mastered anatomy. I've studied it quite a bit, and I have. You can see that in my work, but by I have by no means mastered it. So I'm sharing my own process for continuing to study and grow. Um, I see Professor Diaz is in the chat. Good to see you. Hello. Thanks for uh, for popping in. All right. So back to using Medium. Medium really unlocked it for me because it allowed me to, like I said, brighten the value without losing saturation. And then I did one more piece just as comparison because in the, um, the thumbnail that I was thinning with watercolor, what I was doing was I was using just burnt sienna, very diluted for these Kirby crackles around the dragon kind of lightly. I was using burnt umber for the foreground. And then the dragon itself was a combination of burnt sienna and burnt umber. So it was, you know, a little bit cooler than the, the Kirby crackles on the background, but a little bit warmer than the foreground, which was all Sienna. So I wanted to try and recreate that and also have the, the lightness of value. But again, in the end, the one that is basically the burnt Sienna and white base. So both of these, I used, um, I used mediums to thin it, to thin down the colors so I could raise the value and use them as accents. But this one here is the one, that's the final one. So I showed you all of these so that I can, you know, tell you where I'm going with the dragon painting. And the reason why I want to tell you where I'm going with the dragon painting is because that thing is massive. I can't share it here on YouTube while I'm working on it because it's really big. I would have to completely change my camera setup and it would be kind of disruptive to uh, my family environment because it's in the living room. Um, so I'll continue to share posts. I'll take like, you know, work in progress, get, make animated gifts. I'll take photos as I go and I'll share those. You guys can see how that painting is coming along, but I'm not going to be able to share that as I continue to live stream. But this really informed my process going forward and the experiment that I want to shift to right now. Um, see, I see Cassiel's here in the chat. He says, hello, Cass Cassie Da Vinci NMN is here. He says, well, hello, everyone. What's going on? Uh, so I was talking through all of these thumbnails these copious thumbnails. And the way that this applies to what I'm gonna be doing going forward is that this process was basically me, basically me relearning how to paint in acrylic. I used to paint in acrylic when I was in college. 
I'm way out of practice. I've done some acrylic paintings since college. Um, there was a point where that I was doing large acrylic paintings on canvas. <clears throat> but I think when I started working on Morningstar, and when I got shifted back to doing more comics focused work, I really fell out of doing any kind of painting. And this, just in the, the fact of doing this, I even made a note for myself on this thing where I said that um, that my entire college experience um, painting has been a waste. I should have been doing annotated thumbnails like this. Um, so this whole process of just doing tiny little thumbnails to figure out what I want to do with the painting, I would have learned so much more in college if I had done it this way. Instead of just, we have an assignment, I start a painting, I maybe do a couple of sketches, then go. This process of working everything out in multiple thumbnails taught me so much. And then I thought to myself, huh, I still have not mastered digital painting. It's more like I tend to color my line art digitally as opposed to being a digital painter. But I thought this process taught me or re now true, I had familiarity with, uh, with painting and acrylics from college, but this process working on a bunch of thumbnails, you know, on, you know, a couple of sheets basically taught me how to do it. And I thought, how about applying acrylic painting, applying traditional painting process to digital painting? So I thought, hey, I'm still, you know, trying to learn and grow and master with that. So I thought, why don't I shift back to, let me, uh, let me switch away from the tiny camera for a second so that I can move that arm out of the way. And now I'm going to bring my digital setup back up. I got to put these thumbnails somewhere. I'll put them under here. Uh, so my digital setup is that I have a, a drawing board that I have little binder clips on the bottom of. And I use that and I put this right below the camera that you guys are looking at me on, that you guys are watching me on. And then I put my tablet on said drawing board so that it's kind of upright. I've got like a, a yoga block that I'm using to hold it more upright. I like to draw, I don't like to draw with it flat in front of me. I like to have it angled up like you're in a, um, like as if you're in a figure drawing class and you've got your uh, your drawing board angled up so that you can see what you're doing. So let me bring this open and switch from that camera view to the tablet view. And then we are back in business. There we go. Back in the digital realm. All right. Let's see here. Herman mentions, I just got a copy of Rebel. He said it's digital painting, but it mimics traditional um, watercolor, gouache, oil, pencil, pastel, etc. real time. This may be something you want to check out. You know what? I will make a note of that. Um, I've been pretty happy with Procreate lately, but I also have a, a program called Infinite Painter that is really, really good. Um, I will check out Rebel. See here. <laughs> and man says uh, that uh, that shirt t-shirt suits you, my man. I've got for for those who didn't catch it, I've got a a shirt that um. Well, let me switch back. So it says um. It's a Medusa shirt because obviously I've been drawing a gang of Medusas. It says, um, caution, avoid direct contact with eyes. Um, actually, I have this shirt available. I designed it. So it, my, my Medusa obsession continues. You know, it goes back quite a ways. But um, yeah, I designed this shirt and it's available on my um, on my store. If you just go to the, the Jeremy.net website, the description's in the links. 
that will take you to uh, the store. You can get this. I don't have it in yellow anymore because my, my shirt manufacturer stopped carrying yellow t-shirts. So what I did is I have it in black and the graphic, the icons are in yellow. So it's a black and yellow as opposed to a, a fully yellow shirt. Um, let's see here. Cassiel says the Riley method to draw heads was very useful to understand the anatomy of the head. Um, I have heard great things about the Riley method. However, it just, I've never really enjoyed, I've tried it a couple of times. I've never really studied it in depth. I, I more prefer sort of the Bridgman Loomis approach where it's more just sort of blocks and, uh, and major masses and then slowly breaking down, not necessarily the planes. I might break down kind of the front, top, and side, but that it's really more about working out the anatomical masses. There's a lot of people that swear by the Riley method. And I am sort of method agnostic. I don't say, oh, you should use my method. You should use, you know, method A or B or C. I am sort of like, do whatever gets the job done for you. Because everybody, you know, everybody's brain is different. Everyone interprets artwork differently. And I just say, use the method that helps you get the results that you want. So here is what I'm thinking. I've got this thumbnail. And now I want to repeat what I was doing with all those dragon thumbnails. So first I'm just gonna rework this drawing. That's the other thing is I tend to be somebody who's very, very linear. And in working in color, I was able to I'm trying to be the best way to describe this. You know, working with paint, I re, I didn't even really think about it to the last couple of thumbnails that I was not working linearly at all. Working with line art and then coloring it the way that I, I tend to traditionally work. I was working, you know, like a painter where I was just painting, working with color and value, um, using using color and value to build mass. I mean, using, using light and tone to build mass and, and volume and, and shape. And I thought, huh. So right now I'm working linearly, but I may, I think that I need to figure out how to translate this a little bit more into How to translate this more into uh, working in terms of just color. Not color, but just, you know, working, I'm trying to think of a way to do it non-linearly in a light and mass type manner. I've shifted into that place where I'm starting to imagine and use the creative part of my brain and it's disrupting my ability to talk and draw at the same time. Because I'm sometimes it's very easy for me to describe what I'm doing. And other times when I'm actually when I'm actually problem solving at the moment, that's when my uh, my my verbal abilities break down. But I guess what I'm trying to do right now is start with just refining this thumbnail before shifting into some form of color. Let's see here. Cassie also mentions uh, Bern Hogarth and Will Weston was helpful. Yeah, you know, I have taken a class with Will Weston. It wasn't working on, uh, on figure drawing. It was his, um, his class on, um, environmental design and prop and character design. It was like, it was a, an animation class. It was on a layout and then props. And it was incredibly invaluable. And he's a great instructor. I really enjoyed studying with him and it was nice to get to stay with him in person. Um, hell, I'd love to take another class with him again sometime. 
His classes are pricey, but he's worth it. I have been very, very lucky to study with a lot of great instructors over the years. And even though I continue to take class with Carl Ganas, you know, I think that it behooves people to like, it, it, I think it behooves an artist to study with as many people as possible. I mean, not to the point of schizophrenia, but definitely getting multiple instructors perspective on different types of artistic problems. I think what it does is it helps you develop your own, develop your own opinions. Cause I think it's very easy to simply study with an instructor and say, well, this is the way, this is the way. Um, whereas when you study with multiple instructors, it, you know, you, you're forced to reckon with the differences that the instructors have. And most instructors are not trying to cut down any other instructor's approach. They're just saying, this is what works for me. This is the process I've developed and I'm sharing that with you. Um, so it's not a competition thing. But in that, you as the individual student are forced to reckon with those and reconcile with them and decide for yourself, okay, if there's two different ways to conceive of form or anatomy or, or volume or composition, if there's multiple ways to conceive of it, what, ones, what process speaks to me? And also the, the idea of maybe multiple processes speak to you and learning enough about multiple instructors' approaches that you can pick and choose depending on what you're working on. <laughs> yeah, Cassiel gets it. He says, staying for different masters and uh, just don't get stuck from one. Good point. And, uh, and Byron says, you never know what techniques or methods will click for you until you give them a try. With the internet, we have a buffet of options. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll tell you, um, Bobby Chu's schoolism, they're having a sale right now. I think, I don't know if it's till the end of the year. I don't know if it's until uh, the end of uh, December. But I, the only reason why I am not signing up for it is because I know that I don't, I'm so behind. Wow. I just broke the clamp on this table. Uh, I'm so behind on personal projects that I don't want to stop, take away from that and add like another course that I don't have time to take right now. Cause I also, I've enrolled in a, a course that's more business related that I haven't made very much progress at all in. <clears throat> and I want to wait until I have time to really do a deep dive on schoolism because schoolism seems like one of those things that I could just have the permanent subscription and just work through all of the courses. Like it seems like one of those things where I'm just like, no, that's just part of my life is every week I spend a little bit of time working on some schoolism courses and it just becomes part of my continued study along with the, the classes I'm currently taking. Um, but I definitely, I, you know, I have not taken a schoolism course, but I've watched enough of Bobby Chu's videos and videos he's had with his different instructors that I feel comfortable saying, if you're looking for some some great educational resources, I mean, it, it's along the, the quality of a lot of the, the CDMA or, uh, you know, Digital Art Academy, that kind of thing. But it's at a, you know, I, I think that from what I've seen, Bobby Chu's goal is to make art education affordable. You don't have kids going into like, $100,000 worth of debt for a career that may or may not allow them to make that kind of money. Um, it seems like he's really operating from uh, from a good place, from a, a, a an altruistic place. So I recommend it. And when I have time in my uh, my schedule, I plan to to take those on, take on some of his courses as well. You know, I'll tell you, working out color while I'm just sketching is harder than working out the composition and anatomy because the part of me that's talking, like literally the part of my brain that's, that's making the words right now that are coming out of my mouth, feels like it is the part of my brain that evaluates drawings. 
So maybe I should shut up for a minute and just sketch. But I will tell you that what I'm thinking here is I'm just trying to figure out like right now, I can tell you that this thumbnail that I'm drawing next, the second thumbnail is not as good as the first thumbnail. And I can tell you the, the problem is the part of me that's speaking, I need that part to actually say, okay, this is what's wrong and why. Like I'm sure you guys watch can look and say, oh, well, you know, that part's out of proportion in comparison to another. Like all of those things in terms of the, the assessment part of my brain, I think is shared by my verbal speech centers. Let's see. Herman says, I feel you on that. He said, I'm wasting money on schoolism. I was a caregiver to my pops before he passed in 2019. I'm sorry to hear that. Sorry for your loss. Um, he says, I'm just getting back into art and sketching in my own time. And it's like, yeah, it, I, and I, I understand. Just to clarify what he's saying, it's not that schoolism itself is a waste of money. It's saying waiting to sign up until you're in a place ment mentally, emotionally, time-wise to be able to take advantage of it. You know, that's that's the thing. It's like it wouldn't be good. That's re my, my yeah, my, my point. He's backing that up, which is just that I did have not signed up for it, not because I don't think it's fantastic, but because I know I can't take advantage of it. It would be a waste of my time to do it now, but I think that it's incredibly valuable. Um, and, uh, yeah, Byron says, uh, in all honesty, with great art courses you can get online, it's hard to imagine why anyone would want to go to art school nowadays. And, uh, and let's see, Herman says, agree, Byron. It's funny. None of these courses were like that, um, um, were, were like that as now. I said, I would have... I would have saved money on colleges. I went um, on colleges I went to. I owe like a hundred thousand now. Yeah, I I was very, very lucky in that I was an athlete in college, so I had an athletic scholarship. Um, it was not a full ride, but it covered books and tuition. So I just had to basically pay for room and board. But room and board in Los Angeles for four years is still pretty damn expensive. So I didn't get away without any student loans. But it certainly wasn't the the massive, massive fees that I think a lot of people come out of school art school with. I will tell you that there's some programs like Cal Arts and Art Center. The thing about them is Cal Arts in particular is I think pretty good at uh, at student placement. So, you know, when you get out of school or even before you finish, you know, hopefully you can already have a job lined up, having done maybe some internships or just having a, a program for getting students placed. Now, I'll, another place that I will tell you, I have not taken any of their classes, but I've watched their DVD videos and I've taken tours of the facility is Nomen. Um, they are a, a school in Hollywood, and they specifically are an entertainment um, design program where they're teaching people how to work in the video game industry, in film and television, um, concept art. Like they have multiple educational tracks, but they, you know, their whole thing is they are looking at. They're in Hollywood. And they're looking at the entertainment industry and they're like, what are the skills that students need to be competitive in this field? And they're teaching students those skills. Um, I've been fortunate enough to, to be on their campus multiple times and get tours of their facilities. Um, shout out to my buddy, Carlos Mendoza. He uh, set that up with his, his artisan, um, artisan Social Club, which is kind of an educational art group Kind of, it's an educational social club. It's exactly what he said. It's a social club for kind of getting people, getting people of usually young people, but people of all ages that want to make things that are want to be creative, but don't know where to start, and just getting them in front of professionals 
where they can tell them about their experiences in the arts, where they've been working, how the, what, you know, what the experience has been like. But they've had a lot of, the, you know, a lot of the events have been at Nomen. And it's been a great chance to to hear some amazing industry professionals in uh, in video games and uh, concept design talk about their work, their process, their background, how they've learned. I mentioned this to say that you know the the conversation about art school. I think a lot of people tell you it's not that art school is worthless. It's just that it's not necessarily worth the money for the amount that you're going to make coming out of school. And it is still difficult to make a full-time living as a, as an, as a creative and you may not be able to pay back those student loans and then you're screwed and you, you know, trying to find a way to, to make a living while you've got like crazy student loan bills. And I'm just mentioning some programs that are expensive, but that I actually think are worth what they're charging. And I would say that Nomen would be one of them. Now, I'll tell you, the thing that I'm realizing as I'm drawing this thumbnail is I'm starting to go in and do shading. And I still don't really have the structure down. That's a bad idea. It's a bad idea for me to go in and try and dig deeper into this piece when I haven't gotten the uh, the basics down. So I'm just going to draw another one next to it. So this is the whole whole idea of me trying to apply what I learned from uh, from doing all those those painting thumbnails. I'm going to try and apply that to working digitally. Step one is getting a, a composition that I feel rock solid about. And right now, the composition, that, that initial sketch that I have, the composition, I think, is fine. It's just that the drawing itself is sort of Lumpy isn't the right word. But it doesn't feel... It doesn't feel solid. It doesn't feel fully constructed yet. And that's what I'm trying to do, is get to a level of construction where the drawing itself feels like a very, very solid, everything's worked out, the anatomy's worked out, the proportions are worked out. And if I can work it out at a thumbnail stage, so that this small drawing feels almost sculptural, then that means that when I go to the next stage in terms of working on value, the next stage will be building on a strong foundation. That's the thing. I like the, the shapes of the first thumbnail. And this is a challenge that I have frequently when it comes to, uh, to thumbnailing, is converting a drawing from the general shapes to the construction without losing what makes it dynamic. And this also comes back to something that I was saying before about, um, on one hand, I learned a lot by doing multiple thumbnails. On the other hand, I'm also, I've been saying, oh, I wanna be less precious about my pieces. So I've got these two conflicting ideas that I'm working on resolving, and you guys get to watch. <laughs> you know, the, the, cons the conflicting idea is being, okay, well, I can just do a, a rough sketch and not obsess over it and just make the piece, and then if it isn't bad, make another piece. 
versus when I take the time to do multiple thumbnails and really work out all of the details, then I get a piece I'm happy with. You know, it took me, you know, 13 thumbnails to get to a dragon painting, that I, a dragon thumbnail that I really feel will give me a strong piece going forward. Like this already, I can tell you the problem I have here is that I don't have the head tilted the right direction. It should be tilted slightly away from us. Not as much as this arrow, just a little bit so that we're looking. If I were to take this, uh, this skull here in the, the corner, if I were to take this skull and tell you it's tilted, as opposed to tilted, damn. She wanted to hold on to my head. As opposed to it being tilted towards you, I want it tilted slightly back. Just a little bit more than it is right now. Let's see here. <laughs> Cassiel says, I see some resemblances and likeness in some methods. Yeah, in terms of going back and forth, there's definitely overlap. I mean, if, if you follow everything back to the old masters, that's kind of the thing that um, that can be, uh, you know, most people, arguably the old masters were the, the best draftsmen in all of history. And everything that's come after that's just been people trying to be as good as they are. But they kind of like perfected the formula and everything else is coming after that. Um, and I think that's when you say that there's some, some overlap and resemblance in methods is that there's definitely refinements in different approaches to drawing that I think all people can go back to the old masters and look at. Um, Byron says the duality of man in terms of the whole, you know, working spontaneously versus working methodically. That is, um, you know what? I think that's what I'm going to call this. Originally, I was going to call this video applying digital, applying traditional painting techniques to a, to digital, but now I think uh, working, working spot methodically versus spontaneously. I can write that down on the side. I don't need to write that on the, the digital screen here. Ah, oh, let's see here. I see Johnny in the chat. Hey, Johnny, how you how you doing? How you hanging in there? Um, I hope you were having a, a better day than yesterday. Yeah, he was having a rough time with some stuff. Um, I'll leave it at that. It's up to you if you want to talk with the rest of the guys in the chat about what's going on. But I hope you're uh, you're you're doing okay. Um, let's see here. Byron says. Uh, I think perhaps one of the ways that could help you solve that divide in your thoughts is having a clearer mental image or goal um, that what you want for the piece to begin with. And you are right. I definitely agree with that. I think for me, the problem is that the thumbnail that I have, the very first one that's you know, on this particular set, that is the closest to a clear image that I have. And usually for me, the thumbnail process is clarifying that, that mental picture. That's, that's why I do thumbnails. And I find that sometimes I stop too soon. Like as soon as I, I get my mental image clear enough that I'm like, like in theory, I actually started moving towards doing a painting of the thumbnail I have here. But that's the uh the, the problem i find is i will sometimes move i think that i have clarified my mental image when i have it that's really what i'm trying to say here is that thumbnail that i have there some people could take the that first thumbnail this one over here on the left could take that and say yeah i can do a digital painting off of that fine i, I see everything i need there and they just would choose what colors are going to do and maybe tweak the values a little bit and go 
And I find that the stage where this thumbnail is right now, some people can do that. I feel like I need, when I proceed to refining a piece, well, that's the thing. It's not refined. If I were to proceed to color or making a, a, a finished line drawing, each one of those steps feels like it is wonkier and wonkier, like I'm building on a not firm foundation. And there's something about the act of doing these multiple thumbnails that I do that helps me crystallize. Like you said, having a clear mental image. I There are definitely artists who they can look it, in their mind's eye and see the finished piece. And then it's just a matter of getting it all on the page. I am not one of those people. I am a person who works every like I everything is foggy to me it's very dreamlike and it is this act that we're doing right now I'm sharing with you this is how I get from the dreamlike foggy image to an actual finished piece and I think that in the idea it's similar to sculpture in the fact that like I'm basically sitting here and I'm showing you me turning my my shapes the, the kind of the silhouette of the figure, I'm turning this into blocks and now I'm trying to treat it like sculpture and, and go in and draw. Draw in blocks, you know, and carving into those blocks. Let's see here. Johnny says, uh, unfortunately, no, just stopped by to say hi. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to hear it, but, but thank you for, for dropping by. You are always welcome to come by and hang out and just see what everyone's doing. Um, and, and like I said, if, if you want to talk later on, uh, on Twitter, feel free to, uh, to message me. I'm, I'm always trying to talk, man. Let's see here. Um, Cassiel says, Charles, who is, is pretty, um, is pretty interesting and it's very red. I will check out um, Charles Who. I've heard the name, but it doesn't ring a bell. So I'm sure that once I, I go and, and look him up, I'll be like, oh, it's that guy. Um, I just don't remember off the top of my head. Let's see here. See Mark Molino in the chat says, what's up? Thanks for, for stopping by, Mark. Just drawing some, uh, some digital thumbnails, trying to uh, work my way to a more solid piece. Let's see here. Byron says, if thumbnails exist to help you figure out the idea, then maybe there's a reason that's part um, that part of the process exists. Then maybe there's a reason that part of the process exists for a reason. Um, yeah, I, I agree. It's for me, it is not necessarily that I'm trying to eliminate thumbnails. It's that I also agree that there is something about not being a, and this is something that the Painted in Color podcast was talking about. They did a video recently that I really enjoyed called, um, called um, Perfectionism versus Excellence. And the idea of pursuing making a good piece, not just you know shitting something out versus obsessing to an unhealthy degree. And the problem for me personally, is that I live in between the world of perfectionism and excellence. I'm constantly trying to pursue and do better work. But I find that when I let go and just say, you know what, I'm not going to obsess over this. I'm just going to kind of make the thing. A lot of times I am dissatisfied with the result. And it's not about trying to satisfy a, a client because this is all pretty much personal work. When I'm doing my, my work for my day job, I'm pretty dispassionate about it. I don't get upset about changes that are asked. I don't get upset about saying, hey, this isn't right. I just, someone tells me that they want to change. I ask them to clearly communicate what that change is, and then they just make the change. I don't, you know, it, it's up to them to decide whether they are happy with it or not. And there's definitely been times when I was very happy with the piece and I was told to change it. Um, there are times when I, was incredibly dissatisfied with the piece and they were told, yes, this is what we want, run with it. 
And I'm like, well, that's that's what they want. Um, but I'm pretty dispassionate about it. With my own personal work, it is much more of a a labor for me to get to something that I am genuinely satisfied with. I feel like I should use a different brush for this only because, well, see, I really like the brush that I'm using for sketching, but I'm trying to get myself into the habit of having a light touch on the, the stylus. And I find that I'm pressing harder to want to go darker. And I really should just stay light is what I should do. In fact, let me drop the opacity on this and knock a lot of this back. Not erase it completely, but just, just knocking it back. So yeah, it's my 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 struggles are less about oh thumbnails are wrong or they're bad or I shouldn't be doing them. It's trying to I guess I'm trying to bring more spontaneity into my process, but the previous methods of trying to do put spontaneity into my process was just getting a thumbnail that works and then going. But now I realize that my thumbnails themselves are not as working as I thought they were. Let's see here. Yeah, I see a spam bot in there. Um, the art casters were, um, were talking about that, that they've been getting a bunch of spam bots in their chats lately. And I had been lucky that mostly I, I haven't had that problem. But when they mentioned it just this past week, I was like, huh, all right, yeah, I'm probably going to end up seeing that in my uh, my streams soon. I think they just it just took a while for the, the spam bots to make their way around to me. Let's see here. Um, Mark says, do you have any tips on perspective? It's my weakness when it comes to backgrounds. Um, well, I will tell you that perspective, it's not really a, a simple, it, a simple do A, B, and C type topic. It does kind of require a, a deep dive. Um, the first thing that I would ask is, do you own any books specifically on perspective, not any other topics, just a, a perspective book? Because much like owning an anatomy book, I feel like in order to learn perspective, you need to own a, a book on perspective. And uh, and I would say to my, my big tip would be get a good book on perspective and work through as many of the exercises in terms of just sketching them out as you possibly can. Um, for myself, I will say, I've got a couple right here in my bookcase, I have a few. Let's see here. Oh, that's weird. So, where's this? Where's this? So, my go to perspective book is, um, is Perspective for Comic Book Artists by David Chelsea. And again, if you go to the uh, the art casters, I don't know whether it's on Joshua Kimball's channel or on uh, Scott Circlin's channel, the Circworks channel. But if you type it in Google, Art Casters, David Chelsea, they have a long interview with the author of this book. And it was a really great interview. Um, this book has been my go-to because I'm a comic book artist. It's good to have these, um, it's good to you know have a resource. And the nice thing about it is that it is, it's drawn like, um, 
like Scott McCloud's um, Understanding Comics. So it is a graphic novel about perspective. So it's told in a comic book format. Um, I would definitely get this book and then sketch from it. Um, now, I have not had a chance to dive into this book yet, but um, Marcos Matumestre, I'm, not, I'm sure I'm butchering his name, but he's a concept artist and he has two books, Framed Ink, uh, frame, well, he has Framed Ink, Framed Ink 2, and then he has Framed Perspective. And it's sort of like perspective for visual storytellers. So whether you're doing storyboards, concept art, video games, comics, these books are for them. I have Frame Perspective Volume 1 as well, and I don't know why I don't see it on my bookshelf. Um, but these are the two that are right at my bookshelf. Um, there's another book. Uh, there's another book that I have, but isn't here at my, um, at my, uh, my, my bookshelf. That's my, my immediate right behind me. Oh, wait, I'm going back to the old setup. Let me go to, oh, no, no, that is, okay. No, everything's fine. Um, um, there's a book by Ernest Norling called uh, Perspective the Easy Way. And that book is a very stripped down perspective fundamentals book. Um, I recommend that. That was recommended to me by John Messer uh, when I took his class on. Uh, his, he was the one who had the class on environmental design. Um, Will Weston's class was on uh, layout, but. Uh, um, John Messer had a, has a great course on a, on environment design that I took, and he teaches perspective at the the Animation Guild. But um, but he was the one who recommended the the Ernest Norling book, and I have found it to be a great book. Although I have not had time to do studies from uh, maybe that's something that I'm going to do in the art book study group when we finish doing anatomy. I'm going to probably put it up for a vote and see if people want to do perspective or if they want to do um, animal drawing. So I've got a couple of animal drawing books that we've started. But that's the thing. Perspective is one of those things where the, the tip is to study it. It's not like there's one trick where it's like, do this, do that. Um, and I wish that I had a very simple tip. You know what? I do have a simple tip I can give you, which is – that one point perspective will really do the trick for a lot of illustrations. Um, that was one of the things that I think um, I learned from, from John Messer. Let me turn the opacity up on this. Believe it or not, for as complicated a subject as perspective, you know, let me just draw this freehand, who cares? For as complicated a subject as perspective is, it really comes down to choose your horizon line. Maybe you've got a low horizon. Maybe you've got a tall horizon. Decide where you want your vanishing point. And if you're doing one point perspective, you know, you, you just put your vanishing point anywhere, you know, along the horizon. If you're doing two point perspective, you only want you uh, you want your vanishing points as far apart as possible, but for one point perspective, you can just say, "All right, if this is my vanishing point, you just make sure that all of your buildings, all of your cars, you know, everything points to that vanishing point." Now, the one tip that I will say this will be useful for you is scale. Scale is what helps sell perspective because you can have all of your buildings and your cars look like they are heading towards that vanishing point. But if the scale is off, then everything's going to look wonky. So let's say that you've got this vanishing point here and you decide, let's say that the figure is on the horizon. You decide, okay, this is a man's head. This is their body. You have established scale by putting a figure in this environment. But what that means is you need to keep that scale consistently. So if this is the size of a man standing, 
If you put a car next to him, the car is not going to be taller than the guy. But let's say the car's roof comes up to like shoulder height. You might say, all right, this box that I'm putting in here. Like that's the size of a car. This height that is a man is going to be the same all the way across. Meaning that if you put a figure, let me switch to a different color. You have established that this is the time to use the uh, the correct the the uh, the autocorrect here, where you can draw straight lines and procreate. You have established that this height right here, that's the height of a figure. But see these red lines, if you go down here, that is the height of a, of a person. If you go down here, that's the height of a person. Now what that means is, let's say that a person is maybe six feet tall. If you've got a building, let's say a building is 12 feet tall. That means that the, a one-story building, let's say it's gonna be twice the height of the guy, that means that this is going to be the height of a building. And if you go to, let's say you go down here, I'm going to show you that you can use this anywhere in the piece. For instance, if you go all the way back here, and you say this is the height of a guy, and if you double that, that's the height of a building, you can go now horizontally over to the other side. And you can say, all right, so this height right here is double the height of a figure, meaning that this far back in space, like let's say right here, this building, if I put a building right here, So that's like a one story, and if you double it, that's two story. Again, I gotta keep it consistent, pointing towards our vanishing point. And I shouldn't have made my vanishing point such a big blob. I should have really made it a small point to make this feel more accurate. But what I'm getting at here is that this building that I just drew back here, this two story building, is the same size as, if I go up here now, this, this is again, one figure, this is one story. So if I were to go up again, double this height. So one, two, three, four. What I've just shown you right here is that this, let me put a row of windows to kind of give you the sense that, uh, What I'm trying to get at is, is that this building that I just drew in red here is the same height as this building that's over here. It's just so that that building that's over here on the left is farther back in space. But they're the same height. And you can use a – human figures are a great thing to use for scale. I'm going to draw one more. I'm going to switch to blue now and just show you. So, yeah that height that I was talking about. So if this is a two story building and one story is double the height of a human figure, that scale is the same. A human figure, this little blue dot that I drew down here, this little guy is the same height as this guy over here. So that's a tip for perspective is that you might have your perspective all worked out, like all your points are heading towards your, your vanishing point. But if your scale is wrong, if you have figures that are the, that are different sizes in space, and if you have like cars, buildings, whatever they are, if all of them, if the scales don't match, your perspective will feel wrong, even though everything's heading to the right vanishing points. So figure out your scale. So let's say figure out 
scale and stick to it. That is my perspective tip for you. So it's less about drawing in perspective than how to make your perspective feel convincingly. Um, I didn't want to just not give you any type of tip at all. So Mark, hopefully that is somewhat useful, somewhat helpful. Let's see here. Um, Byron mentions going back away from perspective now. I love how I just swing wildly from topic to topic. But you know what? That's what we do here. It's just us hanging out in the studio. Um, Byron says, in all honesty, hearing you explain your thoughts in more detail, I think it makes sense why you feel the way you do. Since your personal projects have been have the passion, that's um, um, where you'll you know naturally you know, that's where you'll naturally want to refine and pull all your attention. Maybe it's not as big of an issue as it seems innately. It feels like it'll sort itself out in due time. I think that you are correct. You're very correct in that. And I will tell you that a lot of what I find troubling, I'm just going to go ahead and Well, I think that we're almost at, at uh, wrapping up time. Um, I think that a lot of what the, the problems that I have in terms of my process and how much I do of working out, I think it comes down to how many hours I spend per week drawing. Because most days I get one hour per day of creative time in. And I think that if you're drawing three or four hours a day, that's when you're in that flow where the problem solving happens quicker. And that's where you do get to the point where you're the, the, the ability to have a clear mental picture of what your piece is in your mind. I think that that is an artifact or it is something it's a, it's a skill that grows out of the process of sketching both from reference and from imagination frequently. And it's a muscle that you build up. And I feel like that muscle has atrophied to some degree because I've found that, working around my, my work schedule, I'm consistent in making artwork and I do it every week. I spend a lot of time also studying, taking figure drawing classes, but that particular muscle has not been exercised and doesn't get as much exercise as it should. And I think as I, if I can get back to the point of maybe increasing my daily drawing time, I might be able to, to build that skill back up. So we'll see, but I, I do think you're right in terms of it working everything out in, um, working thing out over things out over time. And, and a man says, uh, passion will eventually prevail over other endeavors. Um, and Byron says consistent scale and eye alignment can get you far. That's true. Like one of the things I learned from Andrew Loomis was, um, he says here, that's how a lot of comic cartoons are able to fake perspective. Andrew Loomis has this great thing in uh, figure drawing for all it's worth, where he talks about hanging figures on the horizon which is simply that if you draw a horizon line, on the horizon line, all things should be consistent. So if you draw a person really close to the camera and their head is that big, and then you draw somebody who's way, way far away and that big, and then you draw someone who's sort of in the medium distance, and then somebody maybe a little bit closer, the whole idea is, if you draw this person and you draw their body and then you draw this person, the idea is that their bodies should be in proportion. See, just that right there, without knowing any perspective at all, if you just draw all of the things on the same horizon. And the way that this works is that you can also say, if I were to come up here and say, all right, by the same token, you've got a horizon line. And let's say that you draw knees. Let's say a kneecap. You draw a kneecap. All of the knee, since that kneecap is on the horizon, 
everyone's knee can, not that, you know, different people are different sizes. You can adjust and put some a little bit above and some a little bit below, but you can have a guy in the foreground whose knee is right there. Is up there, the crotch is all the way up here and they're coming off of the screen. Maybe they're getting ready to, to have a showdown. And meanwhile, you've got another character, their kneecap is there and they are maybe, hell, maybe this one is running or something. The point is, is by hanging everything on the horizon, hanging one body part on the horizon and saying everyone else's body parts are going to be in perspective. See, it's kneecap, kneecap, kneecap. And the other one is head, head, head. But you put them all on the horizon, and they will all feel rel relatively in proportion with each other. And then you've got one person whose kneecap is there. And they're way in the background. He's waving. He's like, hi, hi, I'm the tiny guy here in the back. Okay, that arm is way too big for that figure. But you get my point, which is hanging figures on the horizon is another way to keep everything in scale. Um, and whether it's hanging their head on the horizon, hanging their kneecap, you can hang their waistline or their crotch. The point is, is it, you can do this and it'll give your, your, all of your, uh, your work a sense of consistent scale. So, well, hell, I almost feel like that should be the, the title of the, the, the live stream only because that's the most useful thing, the most useful topic that I, I think I've discussed today. Um, but it's at the end. And I always like to pick something that I talked about earlier in the live stream, name the names. That way if people are watching it later. They don't come in and be like, Where, where's, where's the perspective? You named this video, this is something about perspective. You're going on and on about digital painting and acrylic thumbnails. I don't give a shit about this. Thumbs down. So while this is, I think, the probably the most useful thing I've discussed today, that's not what I'm going to title the video. Um, all right, so we're going to wrap things up here. Um, <laughs> Byron says, sounds like a form of creative anxiety. Um, you're itching to draw things, but um, not enough hours. I think many of us can relate. You know what? Word. I like to act like I don't get upset, like I'm cool about everything and that I don't get anxious. That ain't true. I, I just, I've, I've made peace with living in a constant state of creative anxiety. And that's more of what the, the, I don't seem to care about stuff. Or I don't seem to take things that seriously. That's where the, that's where that attitude comes from is, yeah, I'm going to live in a state of creative anxiety for the rest of my life, but I've made my peace with it. Um, that's a great diagnosis, Byron. Um, and I think that I, the most important thing is I think what you said is true is it will work itself out over time. So I'm, I'm not freaking out about it. I'm just going to keep at it. Um, again, for anyone who is a Patreon subscriber, this week, Wednesday, 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we will be doing Art Book Study Group. We're continuing Walt Reads the Figure. We're in the anatomy section now. The first, you know... 50 pages were all about construction and, and basic volumes. Now we're actually getting into anatomy. I did a whole video where I drew all of the major bones. Um, and now we're getting into the, the muscle section. Um, so that will be uh, some, some more good stuff for, for Patreon subscribers later this week. Um, Byron, again, thanks for, for hanging out, for being in the chat. NMN, uh, Johnny Fitz, stay, stay strong, man. Um, lean into things that make you happy. Don't, don't let things that, that are taking joy away from you. Don't let the, you know, don't, don't deal with that stuff. Focus on the good stuff. Um, Mark, I, I'm glad you, you dropped in. I hope that, that, uh, that perspective tip there was useful for you. Everybody, if there's somebody, you know, that you think would enjoy these videos, please share them, forward them a link, say, Hey, I saw this video. He was talking about traditional painting. I think you'll dig it. Or he was what, talking about, um, perspective. That was kind of useful to me. You know, that's how this channel grows. It's by you guys helping to share the word, um, spread the word. Um, I greatly appreciate it. Um, again, to all my patrons, I've got the new ticker at the bottom, letting people know, um, you know, just a, a thank you to all the patrons. So, you know, definitely if you want to get added to that list, become a Patreon subscriber. Like I said, it's uh, patreon.com slash G-E-R-I-M-I. -I. It's patreon.com slash Jeremy, traditional name, weird spelling. Um, and to NMM, thank you again for pointing out that I had broken links. 
in the descriptions of my videos. That should be fixed. I'm going on to, uh, to fix that in a bunch of the older back videos. But you'll get Artbook Study Group. You'll get, um, you know, that's twice a month. You'll be able to read my comic books digitally for free online. Um, tons of other behind-the-scenes process features. All that patreon.com for as little as $2 a month. My newsletter, newsletter.jeremy.net. You get a free digital sketchbook. I send you posts to let you know when I've got new books available, um, when I'm doing convention appearances, when conventions – well, conventions are back, but when I start doing conventions again. Um, when I'm doing comic conventions, um, get to see behind-the-scenes animated progress GIFs. Get all of that at newsletter.jeremy.net. And to pick up copies of my books physically or if you read digitally on Kindle or Comixology, go to amazon.jeremy.net. They'll forward you to my Amazon author page. Get my first book, I Have the Gods. It's a psychological thriller about a man cursed with visions he cannot control. You can pick up Morningstar, This First Fall from Heaven, told as a Western. Volume 1, Welcome to Heaven. It's uh, issues 1 through 4. You can pick up Volume 2, Abandon All Hope. It contains the conclusion of the series, issues 5 through 8. All that at Amazon.Jeremy.net. They'll forge you to my Amazon author page. Everyone, thank you for the great comments and conversation. I appreciate you guys hanging out, spending time with me as always. That's it for now. Go be creative.